Hello and welcome to a brief video on the October 11th abort of Soyuz MS-10, which was a mission to send cosmonaut Alexei Ovchinin and astronaut Nick Haig to the International Space Station. It went awry at the separation of the Soyuz rocket's boosters. At this point, it is likely that one of the four boosters failed to separate cleanly and instead struck the core stage of the rocket. When the boosters of the Soyuz rocket separate, they make the same distinct visual pattern that all descendants of the R-7 rocket do, the Korolev Cross, named after rocket designer Sergei Korolev, whose basic design has managed to continue flying for the entire 61 years of orbital spaceflight. This time though, the Korolev Cross was accompanied by debris. My main interest in recreating this abort, which thankfully led to the survival and recovery of the two spacefarers, is actually to see if the descent capsule lands in roughly the same location in Kerbal Space Program with realism overhaul as it did in real life. I also want to check the peak G-load and the altitude reached. I currently don't know whether Nick Haig, who was on his first space flight, crossed the Kármán line of 100 kilometers, which would give him his astronaut wings. The sequence of events, which you are about to see, will begin with the launch escape tower being jettisoned a few seconds before booster separation, because it's really only necessary to have the launch escape tower to pull the spacefarers away in high G situations with all the boosters firing. That occurs about 1 minute and 54 seconds into the launch, and then at 2 minutes, the boosters separated and there was damage to the core, which caused that engine to stop, though there wasn't a major explosion. The core shutting down triggers the separation motors on the fairings to pull away the orbital and descent module from the rest of the rocket. The service module of Soyuz stays with the rest of the rocket because it's too heavy to pull away. So here we go with the launch escape tower jettison. And there it goes. And then the boosters stop here at 2 minutes and 3 seconds and separate. And we have the crash into the core which would produce some debris but not an explosion and the fairings pulled away the spacecraft from the service module and probably the grid fins would deploy to stabilize the fairings so that it's not spinning around and around. I don't think that the separation motors on this fairing are particularly large uh, and they're much more visible on the launch escape tower after all. And then at around 2 minutes and 40 seconds the descent module is ejected from the fairing and the orbital module though that doesn't go quite right in the video. Yeah. It's either supposed to slip out the back or the fairings are completely supposed to separate and that did not happen. As you can see from the indicated apoapsis, this simulation of the flight has the descent module crossing 100 kilometers, but just barely. So it's a close call as to whether they actually surpassed the common line. The reported landing location was 20 kilometers east of Jez Kazgan in Kazakhstan, and that location is at 47 degrees 47 minutes north and 67 degrees 42 minutes east. So we're looking for something further east than that. This mission is being compared to the abort of Soyuz 7K-T number 39, also known as Soyuz 18A or Soyuz 18-1, which occurred all the way back in 1975. That was the last and only time this kind of mid-flight abort took place. However, that flight aborted after 4 minutes and 55 seconds, much closer to orbit and a much higher velocity. The result there was that the cosmonauts on that abort experienced 21.3 Gs on the way down, while Alexei and Nick only faced 6 to 7 Gs on this one. In the game, the pre-descent peak G load was verified to be 4.8 Gs, presumably when the spacecraft was pulled from the rocket, and the peak G load, which we are coming up on right here, ended up being 7.1 G's and you'll see me bring up the F3 menu to verify that. The G meter on the side of the nav ball is not entirely accurate. Our landing location ended up being around 50 kilometers southeast of Jezkazgan and further south and east than the actual flight. This suggests that the real mission head towards a higher inclination initially than the ISS, at least given the normal launch azimuth calculation, possibly to avoid overflying certain areas, with the intention to have the upper stage readjust. It is also possible that the fairings and descent module had subtly different aerodynamics than the real thing. Altogether though, the result here is fairly close to what really happened, including the successful recovery of, in this case, Alexei Kerman and Nick Kerman. We will have to wait to learn the exact problem that led to the abort, including whether the component at fault was a fluke, or if an entire batch of that component will have to be replaced on the rockets currently on the assembly line because they all have the manufacturing fault. 
After the manufacturing woes with the engines on the long-serving Proton rocket, it's tough to say, and hopefully the investigation will seek to ensure that cosmonauts and astronauts stay safe, and that it isn't rushed to maintain a launch schedule. Thank you for watching this video on Soyuz MS-10.